Today in the Smuggler's Room, we're gonna find a, a more efficient way to paint indoors without all those fumes making me feel like I'm under a Vader Force choke. Yeah, that's coming up. What's up, you awesome geeks? I'm Brian and welcome to the Smuggler's Room. This week, this chubby geek is checking off one of those projects that has been on our list for well over a decade. I'm gonna build a paint booth, or a spray booth, whichever way you prefer. You see, one of our biggest challenges in finishing a project is the paint. Typically, I would do this outside, or throw on a respirator and spray indoors. Neither one of those are ideal. I live in Colorado as well, which means the weather can really be a challenge. Lately, I've really felt behind in just about every project we have going. Whether that's the room build or a gonk or finishing the Mandalorian costumes, one way or another, they're being held up mostly by paint. So no more of those excuses, no more issues. We're gonna solve that problem and we're gonna geekify a spray booth that's fit for a used universe. Okay, so let's take a quick look at a traditional paint booth. It's a pretty straightforward design. A box, a filter in the rear, and a fan or a blower to move the fumes. The rear of the box has a narrow space between the back panel and the filter. The fan will pull the fumes through the filter and out. Before we get going too far though, we need to discuss the fan and why I chose the fan I did. This is a traditional box fan and many people use these in their hobby booths. However, there's a slight bit of an issue I want to avoid with this, and that's that the motor of the fan is right here. The issue with this is there's a danger of having the paint or fumes directly running across the motor. This can be a hazard, perhaps cause a fire or even an explosion. Now I'll say I've never seen this happen personally, nor do I know anyone that's experienced this. But with all the research I've done on paint boost, hobby, or otherwise, I think I'll avoid the chance of either setting myself or anything in the shop on fire. Seems logical. Okay, so where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with a blower, specifically a Dayton 6FH X9 265 CFM motor. This blower will bring air in here and push air out here. With this type of unit, the motor is mounted here on the side, which keeps the electrical connections out of the direct fumes and lowers the risk of fire hazard that we discussed before. Now, I do wanna make something pretty clear here. This is not going to be a commercially regulated spray booth. In a lot of commercial facilities, there are regulations that you have to follow in order to have something like this. Ours is a hobby booth. If you need something commercial grade, you're gonna to wanna to make most of this out of sheet metal. Now I'm gonna to link to it in the description below to Vulpen Props. They built an amazing spray booth. And on their website, they have a lot of details specifically towards the commercial realm. There's a blog post, a SketchUp file, and all the things that you would need to build that type of booth. But if you wanna build a hobby booth, and you want it to be a sci-fi nerd booth, you're in the right place. Now you know us by now, we couldn't just build a little booth and it couldn't just be a box. So we modeled it based on some influence from the interior of a Ewing from Rogue One. The unit will obviously have a large paint area and a spot for a furnace filter that we can replace as needed. On the rear, we'll have a blower that will pull the fumes out and push them straight out towards our neighbor's kitchen window. We're also gonna cover this thing with details, greeblies, and other bits to give it that in-universe look. All right, we've talked about design, functionality, and now it's time to just build something. So let's do that. First step with this monster cabinet is to break down the large sheets of MDF. I have a track saw set up for this, but I'll be honest, it's about as good as an Ewok in a long jump competition, and it falls short every time. So one of my goals this year is to solve this. There are several out there that are made correctly from manufacturers like Craig and Festool and others, but I've also seen some great DIY versions. So maybe I need an in-universe track setup. That would be pretty cool.
I do have an X-Carve CNC machine, and it could have been used here on a great deal of these angled cuts, especially since I have several that need to match. But this week, I wanted to show you at least this part with some more common tools that you might have in your shop. So I've taken my time, measured eight times, and then hopefully cut once. We'll see how that goes. For the front detail, I want some thickness for the overall look, but I also want to avoid having a ton of material. So I'm setting up an inset piece here, and that'll make more sense in a bit. The jigsaw is a pretty cool tool. It has a lot of versatility, and it's capable of making a lot of sweeping cuts and getting into little narrow spaces that a lot of other tools can't. I'll tell you though, honestly, I've avoided it a lot for a long time. Mostly, that's because I suck with a jigsaw. But one thing I learned recently is that my blades were horrible. And that was compounding the problem. Buy good blades for it. It'll make all the difference in the world. Ah, the router, another great tool. This is a small compact router, but it's great for this particular application. I'm gonna use a flush trim bit on the compact router to even out my pieces. The small bearing at the end of the bit rides along the lower surface and allows me to trim and cut down the excess material on all the pieces above. I purposely cut the top material a little outside of my mark so that I could use this and trim them all the same. And on MDF, it's like cutting butter. Just make sure you wear your mask. Okay, you know that I think MDF is awesome for the lack of wood grain and the ability to create seamless details in a project like this. But the downside is durability. This piece I'm working on is to create the support for the main shelf in the center of the paint booth. If I'd used a material like three quarter inch plywood, I could have ran a dado down the left and right panel and secured the shelf within the dado slots but this is half inch MDF. And if I route the channel in the left and right panels, I'm not gonna have as much material or strong enough material to support the weight of the cabinet in the shelf. You might argue that that could be done and you might be right, but for extra stability, I'm adding these strips for support. Again, if you're looking to how to build a perfect wooden cabinet, this is not the channel for you. But if you wanna make a ridiculous sci-fi cabinet, you're in the exact place you should be. Now I made the bottom deep enough and with supports to eventually add casters. Just to know, I'm not gonna put casters on at this time, but in the future, I may wanna have a spot for them if we ever move shops or I decide I need this cabinet to be mobile. This is just a little extra love for my future self.
I'm here to tell you, my friends, that setbacks are going to happen. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to screw things up. You see, I added this brace here at the top, kind of at the last minute. It wasn't in my plans. And I thought I was super clever because I put it far enough back for this inset piece. Pretty smart, right? Yeah. The other piece, the bigger piece, Houston, we have a problem. So here we go. Let's fix it. It's not the kind of mistake and mess I wanted to deal with this late in the day. And I also realized I was doing a lot of sanding with my face right there, and I wasn't wearing this. MDF is horrible stuff. So uh, don't be an idiot like me. Wear your mask, even when you make mistakes. Right, yeah. Are you one of those amazing Smugglers Guild members? If you are, we wanna say thank you. You're helping keep this crazy train of awesome projects moving forward. You're enabling us to be able to bring to you this year extra episodes throughout the year, geek occasions, geeks of the weeks, and so much more. We can't tell you how much we appreciate all your support and how much we truly enjoy having a community of makers, builders, and supporters all together. So thank each and every one of you. We could not do this without you. This is called a plunge cut. You essentially plunge the blade down into the material and cut the line. It's very effective, but please be careful and take it slow. And keep your digits out of the way from the blade. I heard they're a little difficult to replace. Okay, so here's a little something I'm adding to this project that may or may not be necessary. Due to the shape of the front of the booth and the overall depth, I wanted some adjustability. So I'm gonna build wings that can slide in and out and give more depth and protect from overspray. For the tracks, I'm using some cheap aluminum material that I picked up from my local Home Depot. The material is easy to work with and I can use a lot of my woodworking tools on it safely. Basically, I'm making a crude adjustable track that I can slide a piece of masonite back and forth into. For all 
the detailed panels on the outside of the booth, I did use my laser cutter. That said, I'm hoping the use of the other tools earlier in the episode gives you some ideas on how you could create shapes and designs without a laser. The patterns, for example, that we did for these could be cut out with a jigsaw. You could print a one-to-one -one template on, from your printer, glue it down to your material, and then cut it out. All of our templates and the full design will be available to our Smugglers Guild group on Patreon free, and later this month they'll be put up on our website, and you can find them there. use the critter spray gun on this cabinet and I'm going to use it with a latex interior paint and this is going to save me the time in finishing sealing the entire MDF cabinet. Now I always say that you need to sand and seal your MDF before paint but in this case the critter gun gives me a little bit of a texture that I actually like for this project. Now if you wanted this completely smooth and free of any blemishes, you'd want to sand, seal, and then use some other fine application or tool to paint the actual cabinet. Wow, that was a lot, and we're not finished. We've got a long way left to go. And the reason I didn't start this project is because I knew how much work was gonna be involved in doing it the way I wanted to. It wasn't gonna be just a box. I wanted it to match the aesthetics that we built into our assembly table to match the theme and design of which we did for our little shop refrigerator build. All of which will help the shop feel like it's more in universe. Now we get to move on to the most enjoyable part of this project for me. And that's adding all of those details that will bring this thing to life. Not to mention that we'll get the blower installed, the filter in place, and actually make it a fully functional paint booth, spray booth, hobby spray booth, whichever one you wanna pick. Now there's a mountain of work to do, and I know we won't get to it for next week's episode. However, we do have something you've asked for coming next week, and then we'll finish off the paint booth. Once all that's done, we are gonna dive right back into finishing the gonk and getting another room build. And we have two or three episodes in a row on the room build that I just know you're gonna love. So make sure you hit the subscribe button. If you enjoyed this, please hit a thumbs up because it really does matter to us and it helps grow the channel. And uh, yeah, we'll see you the next time we build something out of nothing. Thank you. The lessons sound so very